Walking a path along the roots of Pikes Peak, the world around you resonates with the kind of music. The whisper of the trees through the pine, the gurgling of the creek, the not too distant howl of a wolf. Well, this last thing actually makes you a little uncomfortable. So you take the fork in the path toward the Anselm Society Digital Pub. Inside is a raucous conversation on the arts, faith, and where Andrew Peterson's songs fall on the sacred music spectrum. At a corner table by the fire are three people. One of them is trying to warn the others of the impending wolf threat. And that's me, Matthew Melema, and welcome to Believe to See, a podcast of the Anselm Society Arts Guild. The Anselm Society is a coalition of churches across the front range of Colorado dedicated to one very simple goal, a renaissance of the Christian imagination. To find out more about the Anselm Society, please visit us at anselmsociety.org. And while you're there, why don't you rate and review our show or some of our other podcasts? Your five-star reviews help us out a ton, and we really appreciate them. But let's move on to, to more urgent matters now. Mandy? Yes. Hello. Hello. You know, I try to stay out of politics on this show, but th- here's a political issue I, I feel like we should address. Uh, uh, okay. Did you vote in the 2020 election? I did. How did you vote on Colorado's wolf measure? Oh, my gosh. You were scaring me there. On the wolf <laughs> measure. Woo! <laughs> I voted to reintroduce them. Oh, oh, you see, Uh-oh. I vote. I was agreeing with you. I was pro wolf. But then I talked to a buddy who's like an outdoorsman and he brought Uh-oh. up a couple of convincing points. One. Well, OK. He was camping on the Wyoming, Colorado border and mm-hmm. noticed wolves howling around him. So he's like, hey, there are already wolves in Colorado. And second, when you, <laughs> he said that when you reintroduce wolves into an area with too much game and stuff, the wolves become too powerful and dominate the local ecosystem. So, Mandy, oh. you may have just Uh-oh. handed over the state to the wolves. How do oh, you feel? Oh, my goodness. Well, oh, that's heavy. That's really heavy. I don't know. I'm going to have to think on that one. I will have to. Maybe I can learn how to be like a wolf whisperer. Maybe if I, <laughs> if I start oh. now, I can be an expert wolf whisperer just in time and then I'll save us all. How's I, that? for one, welcome our new wolf overlords. Um, yeah, you, can, <laughs> you can like be a spy against the humans when the wolves take over. So oh, there you I, don't go. Mean, I don't mean to alarm you. I just want okay. to bring up the fact that the wolves are going to take over the state. Okay, well. And to prepare yeah. accordingly. Fair warning. Thank yes. you for that. Thank you. So let's transition just slightly just to slightly. our topic today. This is a topic uh, Mandy, me and you were talking about in, in the green room before we start recording. We're both really excited about it. This was brought to our attention by Junius Johnson, who is a friend of Anselm. He's on one of our boards. He's been on the program before. Really great guy. And he personally vouched for our guest in the program today. So the guest is Del Case. And he's joining us now at the table. So, hello, Dell. Nice to see you or hear you. <laughs> yes, it, it's as close as we can come to seeing, considering that we're on the opposite sides of the country. But, uh, Dell, before we get going about you and your project, Deus Ex Musica or Musica, that was something else we discussed in the green room. Mm-hmm. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Well, thanks for having me on. I am a musician and a scholar and a writer who teaches in the Boston area at a small liberal arts college called Wheaton College. And it's actually unrelated to the other Wheaton College you might know in uh, the Oh, you, you guessed area. my question, so thank you. <laughs> right, yeah. I should mention that we were first. Yes, we were you named, should. And we were named no. after a person, not the town. And we were the first, uh, the first women's college in America, historically. Oh, but we went co-ed about 30 years ago, so we lost that distinction. But we're a small liberal arts college that you know, started as a seminary, as most of these New England colleges did, and now we're a secular school, which is a bit ironic because I, most of my work engages with the Christian tradition. I'm a Christian who goes to a large uh, UCC church in Boston, Old South Church, which is on the south side of the city from the Old North Church, which is where Paul Revere did his ride yeah. and put the lantern, if you know oh. that story. So, Okay, um, I'm glad you said that. I was about to ask <laughs> if it was the one if by land, two if by sea church. That's Old North, okay. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So it's quite old, 350 <laughs> years old. So I basically worship at and teach at the less famous of two institutions. Uh, <laughs> if you think about that way. <laughs> um, though Benjamin Franklin did, did go to our church, so which is, which is oh. nice. I am a trained as a classical composer, so I write music for orchestra and chamber ensembles. I've written an opera, but I'm also a 
a scholar and a teacher of popular music history, and I do a lot of work on all genres of popular music. So I do both of those sort of things. I wear those two different sort of intellectual hats, I'm, and I, uh, I hold them both in equal regard, and I, a really important part of my own teaching is, of course, the fact that different genres are different. You know, classical music is not superior. That's really important to me. But I also, and I think why I'm here, is that I am really interested in the ways that music intersects with faith, with theology, and with uh, ecclesiology, if the way we are the church, and the way we are children of God, and the way we learn about God, and faith in each other. And so I do a lot of writing and speaking, and about how both classical and various kinds of popular music sort of help us explore faith in unique ways. Hmm. All right, so and that is definitely what I want to spend the bulk of our time on. But you brought this up, and I'm like, hey, let's just go there. Uh, step up onto your soapbox <laughs> for a minute and give us the case why, contrary to what many might say, popular music, classical music, one is not necessarily better than the other. Go. <laughs> Racism? No, I mean, Ooh. honestly, I mean, <laughs> what I mean is that, you know, there's a long tradition of classical music being supported by the people in power, right? Mm. In America, mm -hmm. in particular, you know, we've got European settlers who trained in Europe, universities, conservatories. These are all founded to bring European styles of music to America and to train uh, generations of American musicians and to, as a result, we have trained generations of music teachers and most of the ways that, you know, future music educators learn is by studying and performing classical music. Yet at the same time, there is, of course, an, a kaleidoscope, a variety of extraordinary music that's not in the Western classical tradition. Much of that is based upon African-American styles and, of course, those folks have not had access to the corridors of power and the structures that allow the, that kind of music to sort of get an inroad into the academy. And if you can't impress the scholars or the, or the people that run universities, it's pretty hard to get your music to sort of penetrate into the established organization of pedagogy. What that means is that basically most of our students listen to popular music principally, but most music educators are not educated enough or in the right ways to actually teach it well. Hmm. Getting around to your question, they are two different languages. And so just like you can't say that French is a better language than Spanish, it's just an impossible thing to do because the languages are different. The problem is that most students and most future music teachers and current music teachers have only been taught how to speak the language of classical music. So it becomes this sort of feedback loop where you only know how to explain the value of classical music because you've only been given the language to do so, and it goes around and around. So, and of course, that does fundamentally come down to, you know, the people who have the opportunity to, <laughs> to have access to the corridors of power. Right. But this is changing a lot, which is really, really great. Mm -hmm. Now, it, every music department in America has courses on non-classical music. Oh, all right. So I asked you to dip your toe in the water, and I just want to keep diving in. And I'm, I'm going to try to resist, but because I think <laughs> this is a fascinating topic. Mandy, what yeah. are your thoughts on that? Because you have a lot more musical training than me. I've made it pretty clear on this podcast. I, I, I have the musical talent of a dying raccoon. But um, oh, okay. the, your, your thoughts, Mandy? Well, I mean, I'm just your average. I took piano as a child, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not that great. But um, I really enjoyed that the way you explain that, because my mother is very much classical music is the only kind of music and it's the only thing that matters. She actually was very instrumental in creating a choral program at the college she went to, University of Tennessee um, in Knoxville. So she's very, may I say, I will say elitist. I was going to say snobby, <laughs> which now I guess I said both. But anyway, but I personally like, my favorite kind of music is actually bluegrass. So I know that's different from popular music too, but I like the way you said that it's a different language because it really, it is. And I, you know, even different instruments are more common in different genres of music in the same way that like different common pronunciations are different for spoken language, if that makes any sense. Sort of like how French, they throw out all the letters and Spanish, they pronounce them all. <laughs> I don't know. You know, so, yeah, I, I, like the, I like the way you said that, that it's different languages. And 
so the reason I brought up bluegrass is that's not African or African American, but again, it is poverty. So it seems like what you're saying is clearly the wealthy are the ones who have access to power, and most often that is Caucasian. But it's true too of those people from Scotland and Ireland that came over and weren't so wealthy and established the bluegrass in Kentucky and stuff. So now anyway, I'm glad you yeah, phrased I, I enjoyed it. That. I'm glad you phrased it that way, Mandy, because I think you have led us to a good segue now because the, oh, these sort welcome. of themes <laughs> seem to come into the the organization you founded, Dell, uh, Deus Ex Musica. Uh, Musica, musica. Um, I'm going to go musica because that sounds like how I was taught to say it in Spanish class in high school. <laughs> but uh, so day sex musica, it seems to be doing the same sort of thing where it's bridging uh, cultural differences, other divides based on music, if I understand it correctly. But Del, explain day sex musica, why you found it and what its mission is. So if you think about church music or someone says the to ask you to think about sacred music or church music, mm-hmm. the first thing that most people think about is the music that you might worship with in church. And now that could yeah. be a praise and worship band. It could be a, you know, a gospel choir. It could be a classical choir singing an anthem. It also could be the stuff that if you go to sort of a traditional worship service, it could be the music that you sing along to. So the hymns, for example, in a, in a more of a traditional church service where you have the choir that sings anthems and then the hymns that the congregation sings. Now, all those kinds of music are similar in that they help, they are a part of worship. They help worship to happen. Now, some of those styles, like these anthems written by, you know, a composer, if you go to a church that worships with classical music, you'll sit down and maybe before the sermon, you'll hear a, an anthem, a choral composition by Mozart that might set, you know, part of the, let's say maybe it could even be set a part of a prayer or a Latin mass or part of the Bible. And the job in that instance is for the music to prepare your heart and mind for the message you're going to receive. In that way, it's instrumental, forgive the pun, because it Ooh. actually is doing something beyond, right? Just right. being music, right? It, it we're, Just like okay. we're not supposed to. And it's funny when you listen to that, like you're not sort of supposed to focus on how good the song is or how well it's performed, right? You have to, if you're doing it right in church, you you have to let it form you as a worshiper in community. Mm -hmm. That's kind of weird because Mozart didn't write his music to do that. He wrote his music to engage with the biblical story or the prayers of the Catholic Church. And most of the, much of, not all, but much of the sacred music he and many composers wrote was intended to be heard in a concert, actually. So actually in a secular setting. Now, admittedly, most people were Catholic or probably practicing Catholics at Mozart's time in Vienna. But again, the idea is that most classical music composers for the last, you know, thousand years, well, let's say maybe, maybe 600 years, when they write music, many of them write music for the concert hall, right? Mm-hmm. And that's really different because when you write a piece of sacred music for the concert hall, you're supposed to focus on the music. You're supposed to ask yourself, hmm, how is this music helping me understand the text or the idea that it's based on? That is, how is the composer has been inspired by some aspect of the Christian tradition, and then he or she is setting it to music, is exploring it through music, just like a Rembrandt would paint, you know, the return of the prodigal son. That's not a painting that you hang up in church and look at, right? Mm-hmm. Instead, you look at it in a museum, and your intended, its intention is to help you understand that story. Does this sort of make sense so far? Yeah. It does, it does. Okay, so here it comes. But there's a weird <laughs> thing, because... Today, Christian composers don't really have a place for our music to go because Mm. churches don't use our music for worship. I'm talking classical musicians. And also, if we perform, have our music performed in a concert, probably the audience is not principally Christian or is not maybe not even interested in really the spiritual component of the music we write. So we kind of have an ideal audience that we're trying to write for, but no chance to speak to that audience. So I spent a year writing a piece of sacred music. I've written a sacred symphony. But when it was performed, it wasn't performed in any sort of religious or spiritual context, which is kind of weird. So Deus Ex Musica's goal is to try to provide ways for sacred music to contribute to the lives of Christians outside of worship. To flip that around we think about how many Christians are missing out on an opportunity to engage with the Bible or theology by not really listening to sacred music, by instead just hearing it as sort of like the background of church worship, if that makes Mm -hmm. sense. 
So fundamentally, what we do is we create events and resources where we gather people together and we listen to sacred music. But we don't do it as a concert. We do it as a springboard for discussion. Sometimes we call these events musical Bible study because it literally is, let's gather around scripture, but instead of reading it together and discussing it, we listen to musical settings of the scripture and then use that music as a lens for conversation about it. And that allows us to create these ecumenical and even interfaith events that use music to bring all different kinds of Christians together in a way that emphasizes our common love for scripture and our common belief in its importance in ways that bring us together rather than sort of divide us. Yeah, you hit on a lot of stuff there that I want to unpack. So let's start with one thing, because I I went in with one definition of sacred music in my head. And what you said just sort of complicated that definition. Because when I think of sacred music, I think, oh, it's going to be like, you know, Gregorian chanting or something that's designed to be done in church. But what you said, which makes a lot of sense historically, is like, yeah, some of it is, but it it wasn't performed in church. It was concert stuff. So it's like... Mm -hmm. What kind of working definition of sacred music do you have with this? And how can I define the parameters? Because it seems like there's a lot more fuzziness around the borders than I initially thought. It's a great question. It's really complicated. And it comes down to the whole secular sacred dichotomy or dialectic, whatever you want to call it, right? A lot of times what you're talking about is sort of what we would call liturgical music. Mm-hmm. So music that's used in the liturgy. Now, a lot of us go to churches that are not liturgical, like we don't have the, the same series of prayers. Whether it's Gregorian chant or a holy, holy, holy you might sing in the you know, Episcopal church or something, or even if it's uh, you know, praise and worship, you know, music for worship, or even a hymn, you're using those as part of the service. So sacred music is not the same as worship or liturgical music. It's larger. So the definition that I tend to use and many people do is music that engages with the sacred in some way. I'm a Christian, it's the tradition that I worship in and I believe in, and so when I say sacred music, I'm referring to music that explores and engages with the Christian tradition. So that could be a devotional hymn that's set to music that you sing you know, on Easter, Christ the Lord has risen today. But it also mm-hmm. could be a piece of concert music that sets you know, part of the Mass or that sets passage of the Bible, uh, which again, you're not using it to worship, but it, in, it is engaging robustly with the Christian tradition. Now, you could say that what I just described is, might be biblical instead of sacred, because many people might say that sacred has to have some kind of um, special characteristic, sort of having more of a mm. spiritual connection to its subject, if you will. And, you know, it depends how you define it. Uh, my perspective is that if there's a piece of music that was written, like could be written by an atheist, but it engages really powerfully and tries to explore and understand the Bible, if I listen to that music with the mindset that it's going to help me engage with the Bible, For me, that becomes maybe not sacred, but sacramental in that it's a place that we can see God opening up and speaking to us. So I actually prefer to use the term sacramental, a small s, to refer to this something in the the created world that allows us to engage with God. Hmm. That is helpful. And and like you said, that there's a lot of complications there. So absolutely. Just so I'm clear, because when I, again, me with my knowledge of a musical talent of a dying possum when i'm when i'm in my church we're doing like a you know contemporary praise and worship song that we'll do sometimes would you consider that sacred broadly defined or is there are there some characteristics that's missing out on oh i absolutely would absolutely okay. i mean it's dedicated to god it helps people to feel god's presence mm-hmm. and everyone sort of agrees that it's doing that as a that that's what it's doing i don't think there's anything in particular notes that make any kind of music closer to god and that's the thing that a lot of people might disagree with. <laughs> but uh, I think it's context and intention are, are what are most important. So the organ oh. is not more holy than the electric guitar. Is what I'm <laughs> I would say, you know what I would say, Mandy? I would say it depends how yeah. they're played. <laughs> okay, there you go. Oh, I like that. Are you that. with me? Yeah, well, I'm totally with you. Yep. 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 Oh, man. So... Listeners, I, I apologize, but my day job is as a lawyer, so that gets me a little obsessed with these sort of definitions and hypotheticals. So I was going to ask a whole series of questions about like, okay, so is it the intention of the composer or is it the way it's interpreted by the listener or all this stuff, which I would find interesting, but maybe we should move on. <laughs> so, so you talk about one of the things I noticed because, you know, prepare for this, I, I visited your website and looked around at what you're looking at. And, and you talk about 
the importance of really listening and engaging with the music itself. Could you talk about what you mean by really listening and how that differs from the way that a lot of us consume our music day to day? Absolutely. You know, there's a difference between hearing and listening. And mm-hmm. if you want to scratch at that, basically listening is active. So we mm-hmm. walk through the lives hearing music a lot, like while we're checking out the supermarket or something like that. But when you stop and say, oh, I like that song. Oh my gosh, here comes the high note. That's listening, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. And I would say that there are various types of listening that are appropriate at different times. But music listening, is a, a better anal- analogy might be con- sort of the act of contemplation of a piece of art or of interpretation. It's when you sort of, you stand in front of a piece of art and you really look at it and you try to, you ask yourself some questions about it. You try to react and respond to it in a way that honors your own emotions, that mm-hmm. sort of allows the painting to reach into you and affect you. It's sort of treating the painting almost as as a real subject, right? Not as an object, as something that might actually work on you. And for me, I think that's similar to how we oftentimes read the Bible. We don't just read it as literature, but we allow it to speak to us, almost like as a conversation partner. We have to be open spiritually to that, I think. So when we listen to music in that way, let's say when we listen to a piece of sacred music, we're basically saying, okay, I'm going to stop for a moment. I'm going to let this piece of music speak to me. I'm going to open myself and explore my responses and then try to interpret it in a way, and this is where we move to Deus Ex Musica, so what? Like, how does this experience of the Bible set to this piece of music? How does it form me as a Christian, as a person of faith? Because at the end of the day, any composer who writes a piece of sacred music that's at least intended for Christians is really writing a sermon. Mm -hmm. Because what we do is we take this text that's in black and white on the page and we interpret it. We give it color, we give it depth, we give it texture, and we can't add any words, but what we can add is a pretty powerful emotional component, which is actually almost too unfair. If you go back to the Little Public by Plato, he basically says, you know, music's pretty slippery, hard to control. It's best to keep it out, <laughs> right? And yeah. as any pastor knows, the musician has way more power than they ought to, right? So being aware of that, right, uh, we, we, I think that a way to listen to sacred music that's helpful for Christians is to hear it as a sermon and to attend to it and not just say that sounds pretty or I didn't think of it that way, but actually say, how might I be a different Christian as a result of hearing this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. That that got me thinking of another one of our uh, Anselm member artists, uh, Joel Clarkson, who's also a composer. And he was talking to me about just trying to put together his compositions and how for him, it it was really important to have like a theme, have a story, have something going instead of just... uh, abstract classical music, which Mm. I'm sure you have way more formed opinions than I do on that subject. But I was going to ask you, going back to setting music to scripture, you talked about how it is like a sermon in some ways. And how do you go about taking a passage of scripture, like say a psalm or, you know, some other passage and trying to set it to music in terms of getting the right emotional stuff, getting the context, What, what kind of study and preparation is involved in that sort of thing? That's a good question. I mean, uh, you know, composers do various different amounts of background work before we set a text. And especially when it comes to a biblical text where there's a sort of pressure, it feels like this pressure to get it, not to get it right, but you got to bring your A game to the Bible, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, (laughs) um, I would say that for me, when I set scripture, I I, I do background reading so I can understand, you know, that, for example, with the Psalms, I sort of read, you know, theologians or biblical scholars about the Psalms. I tend to read a lot of different translations of the psalm because at the end of the day, I have to set one translation, right? And I'm going to, I almost always write in English, you set translation, you know, set biblical text in English because I wanted to have a really wide appeal. And I live in America and I, you know, most of I live in basically basically English speaking place. Um, (laughs) Then I sort of choose the translation that I think will work the best musically as well as sort of, and I also consider accuracy and theology, et cetera, of the translation. But then it really is treating the words on the page as a script or as a libretto, we might say, because, mm. you know, and you, you read it through, you sing it, you try to get the sense of this, of the stresses and the words that should be the highest or the lowest or the loudest, because that's a way that you emphasize words. I could step back and say the two things that composers have to think about, and these are the two things that we do at Deus Ex Musica when we ask people to listen carefully. It's just two things. We have to figure out an overall sort of emotional landscape. What's the sort of general character? What are the main colors, if you will? But then we also have to decide which are the most important words or phrases and how do we emphasize those? 
Mm. So a quick way to learn how to listen sort of in an active or even spiritual way to sacred music is to listen to a, you know, a setting of the Bible and then ask yourself, what are the uh, emotions that come out and what are the words that the composer is emphasizing? Mm. And those are two questions. Those are two ways to get into listening that can then turn around and help you dig into scripture in ways that I think can be spiritually powerful. This is so broadly applicable that even people with the musical talent of a dying possum or dying raccoon, as Matt It depends saying. on the day, whether it's a it possum did. or a raccoon, but so, okay. anyway. But they're always dying. But anyway, yes. even someone who is not musically trained or even knowledgeable, who might normally feel a little intimidated by this, you know, sacred or sacramental music, even that term might intimidate mm-hmm. them a little. But this is so fundamentally accessible to anyone, whether they can read music or not, play music or not. It, it really levels the field and makes it, it just makes it accessible, like I said. And the value is anyone can see it and engage in it and contemplate, as you said, the meaning of the music and what it does to us, the beauty Absolutely. Thanks for recognizing that. I mean, that's our goal because we put on these events and, you know, our first event in Boston in 2018, we asked nine composers from around the world, all representing different Christian traditions, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, you know, evangelical, mainline, whatever, Pentecostal, Mm -hmm. to, they're all composers and they all set psalms to music. We had three composers set one psalm, three set another, three another. And then we basically put on this concert event in Boston where we had the three settings of each just perform boom, boom, boom. So Mm -hmm. the people who gathered could hear three brand new musical interpretations of these ancient texts, you know, Psalm 13, how long, O Lord, right in a row. And then we, we did small group. Then we just got together randomly and asked these two questions. And we've done these events now dozens of times online now principally. And it's amazing how, the differences in theology and denomination just disappear. It's ecumenical because we're the, the music allows us to come together around the fact that we believe the Bible is important and that it's going to speak to us. But we don't need to get it right. It's not like Bible study when you someone's always arguing about whether it happened or didn't or which scholar you read, right? But it's really <laughs> right. just saying, what is this? basically the music allows us to engage scripture in a way that's spiritual and helps in discipleship, right? Or sort of faith formation. And at the same time, it also is a practice that's open to anybody, no matter the level of possum talent that they have, right? Um, <laughs> you know, just like you wouldn't turn someone, someone ought to come to a Bible study and they don't have to know Greek or have a seminary education, yeah. right? Right. It's the same thing, you know? And right. if you add, ask these broad questions, you know, we see, you know, we had about 100 people at our first event in Boston and it was racially diverse. It, we had Pentecostals and Orthodox and Catholics and they all, I mean, it was kind of like heaven. Like we all, they all got together. <laughs> they heard these music and they sat around in peace and talked about the Bible. Oh, and that's lovely. Music allowed this like ecumenical Bible study to happen and no one got no fight, you know, <laughs> and everyone's smiling, <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where I can't believe this actually worked, you know, <laughs> that's, <laughs> but I it does that. work. Yeah. <laughs> Those are really good points to raise. And uh, it, it reminds me of another conversation I had with another Anselm musician, Terry Moon. And I was discussing with her my musical inability. And she brought home the point like, hey, if the composer composes something correctly, you're naturally going to feel the correct emotions. You know, if like going to your mm-hmm. example, Dell, if, if you're getting like uh, the song, How Long, O oh Lord? And everyone's like, wow, that, that was really peppy and upbeat. And I, I really feel this light. It's like, okay, the, the composer would probably be like, okay, I need to change a bunch of stuff because that didn't have the effect I wanted. But to that point, when, when you're talking about really listening and paying attention to music, I, I know, I'll, I'll just confess, when I listen to music, you know, I'll have music, you know, on in the background as I'm like working or driving or whatever. It, it's rarely something that I give my full attention to. So when you're taking people who I'm guessing most people are in my same boat and saying, hey, really pay attention to this. What are the things you want them to pay attention to? Uh, you already mentioned like the, the emotional landscape and all that. But what other things should they be looking at? Well, honestly, you know, we have had success basically asking those two very broad questions. What's the overall mm. emotion that you feel? I ask people to write down adjectives. Mm. That's it. And then I ask people to circle, you know, the word or the phrases on their, you know, their text that, that seem to be the most important. 
And mm. it's kind of amazing. Like, I'm, we're not asking people to figure out what key the piece of music in or, or is in or <laughs> describe the rhythm, right? Because that's the technical stuff. Like, when this, you know, when you have to have your appendix out, you just want the, yeah. you know, <laughs> you don't need to know how it happens. You just need to know that it's going <laughs> right. to happen, it's going to happen, you know? Yeah, don't right? tell me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and that's not very interesting. Like, you know, what's interesting is, like, whether the appendix is out. So, right. this is bad. probably a bad analogy for this. <laughs> much more, it's much more enjoyable having your appendix out. I think, but you know, I mean, it, 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 the, the interesting conversations are ones we've seen that happen again and again, where someone says, "You know, this Psalm 13, how long ago, Lord?" Some of the composers ended the piece very in a very sort of optimistic way, because it does. And there's that turn in that psalm towards, you know, basically, you know, it ends up being sort of yes, but I trust in your loving kindness is basically how it ends. But one of the composers at the very end brings in the little dissonance at the very end, right, the very end. Oh. And it's a little tiny detail, and there, no listener would really be able to describe why it sounds dissonant. But they all pick up on the fact that there is that little thorn in that flesh right there. And wow. that has led to conversations like, have you ever been in the place where you've prayed to God, you felt God's presence, but you're still left with some doubt? Mm -hmm. And I would say that most of us have, right? Mm -hmm. And yes. so that little <laughs> musical thing, that little dissonance, that little thorn in the flesh, makes the musical setting very sort of honest and authentic and actually allows a lot of listeners to appreciate the psalm in a new way because they realize that not all when we say pray the psalms or pray to god we don't always just say well that was well i used to be sad but now there's jesus or right, i'm god and I'm, you know there's god and i'm happy because that's not really how right. it always works you know you with me i mean maybe yes. i'm wrong but oh no i'm with you <laughs> yes <laughs> you know and so this, this yeah. so and i would just say that that's one of the nice things about using contemporary music modern music, because a lot of it is dissonant or even somewhat experimental. And that causes us to re-engage or re-experience these ancient texts in ways that are pretty different. It's almost like they refresh these old texts or mm -hmm. refreshen. So we encounter them in not only in contemporary ways, but also like new ways, if that sort of makes sense. Yeah. But that comes out of just a broad conversation on how did this setting make you feel? <laughs> you know? Right. Well, I mean, I it's a peace of mind when any song, when the music of the song doesn't match the mood <laughs> of the lyrics. <laughs> so I, I'm trekking, trekking with you on that for sure. There's a group called The Corner Room that sets psalms verbatim, the NASB version, to music. And mm -hmm. um, I think mostly for the intention of helping people memorize Mm. The psalms, yeah. I won't say which one, but there is one psalm. I like all of them except for one because for that very reason, I'm like, this does not match how this song feels, <laughs> or at least to me. But I, I love that you had, instead of having nine composers do nine psalms, that is much more interesting to have three and so that you can... Because there really isn't one way to feel or react or absorb the words of scripture. And I love the depth that particularly and uh, the conversations that you alluded to, they must have been really fascinating. I'm going to have to go to these conferences in the future. <laughs> yeah, well, and that, that's part of it, too, is that a lot of us are the Bible is something that all Christians think is extremely important and use in our corporate worship and private devotional. But it also divides us a lot, questions yes. of interpretation. And the question that tends to divide us is, what's the right answer? Mm -hmm. And whereas that is an important question sometimes and in some context, it's not the only question right. about the Bible, I think. And it's not really a spiritual question, right? It's not the question that leads us to a, the most spiritual engagement with the text and with the scripture. Right. And this is my opinion. And so when you have three different musical settings from three different people, you have three different honest and really robust engagements with the text that are offered as possible interpretations, but it's kind of hard to argue with them. That's the other thing, <laughs> which is the most exciting thing about this is that like when we, in these events, like we'll have people say, I like this setting more than this one. Right. You, but you don't hear someone say that one was wrong. <laughs> you know, and even if you do, you're not really saying it's wrong. You're kind of, if person A says, you know, I really felt like this, I feel this when I hear this musical setting. It's hard to turn right. to that person and say, you're wrong. You don't feel that. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. it's kind of like insurance against this kind of thinking because it's not. You just can't really argue with how someone reacts. You can dig into that and explore it, 
But the whole idea of using the arts as a lens for engaging with the Bible is that the arts don't ask the questions that tend to divide us. They ask the deeper questions that allow us to engage with our tradition and with each other in ways that are pretty powerful, I think. Agreed. Yeah, absolutely. And I that just makes me think, yeah, music is so well suited to this because one of the things that's been sticking out to me recently and just doing, you know, study of, you know, church history, scripture and all that is a lot of the church fathers, they would view pretty much every scripture passage through several layers of meaning. They wouldn't mm-hmm. be like, oh, this scripture means X and it means only X. It's like, whoa, there, there's several levels here. There's the literal level sometimes, but there's also the allegorical, yeah. there's the eschatological, all these other levels. So it's like there's different depths of meaning and different people can try to take the same scriptural text and faithfully portray it in ways that may be different because scripture has depth. It has layers. It doesn't necessarily just mean one thing on one level at all times. Like you mentioned, Del, that just seems to be something that music can really bring out much more than, than many other mediums could. Yeah, and I should just mention that if your listeners want to check out a good example of this on our website, which hopefully, hopefully maybe you'll link to, or it's, it's mm-hmm. deus-ex-musica.com, there are three settings of Psalm 148, which is one of the, you know, at the very end, it's praise God, et cetera, et cetera, praise, praise, praise. You know, it's one of those last Psalms. And the three settings are so different, and they just, they point out that praise itself is not a monolithic idea and that we experience and think about praise in different ways in different contexts and in different seasons of our lives and these three short settings of the same words just really bring that home it works really well as a set because again the settings are so different i just find that whole thing fascinating i think it's such a great way to go about it and one of the things i was wondering just uh, in terms of the sort of the, the style that you'd go about doing this you mentioned this these are sort of more modern compositions. So we, we talked earlier about how the you know we'd have like classical, we'd have more popular music, all the stuff in between. Why did you choose the these sort of styles of the compositions that you did there? Now, our initial project, part of the Deus Ex Musica project, was meant to support Christian composers who don't have a, a way for their music to speak to the church audience. Because as I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, if you want your music to be heard in church let's say you study writing choral music, etc. You need to find a church that uses traditional worship. Then you need to write a piece that the choir can sing that will contribute to worship. And that, that it's a great skill to have. But just like not all visual artists create stained glass, some create sculpture or mobiles or <laughs> paintings. Mm-hmm. There, you know, there, there are other places and way, reasons why we would... So basically, we wanted to support, give the opportunity for some Christian composers to write sacred music that could really be used in this sort of spiritual way. Hmm. But, as I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, I, I do not think that Western classical music is the only or best musical style just in terms of value, but also it's certainly not the only or best or most appropriate style for sacred music either. Which means that as we've continued to do these events, especially being forced to do them through Zoom because of the pandemic, we've been actually using lots of different musical styles. So, for example, I recently did an event where we used eight different settings of Psalm 150. Everything from a gospel Ooh, song wow. to Western classical to, um, you know, some like, you know, sort of Irish folk song version by the Gettys, <laughs> you know? like mm-hmm. And it's amazing because all of those, you know, engage with the scripture in totally different ways. So expanding the genres we use is really, really cool. That sounds amazing. It does. <laughs> so... So I wanted to transition. We're, we're running a little low on time, but I wanted to talk about this ecumenical aspect to it because I find it very interesting. And I think a lot of folks may have found it uh, counterintuitive that we can use uh, church music to bring people together. Mandy, let me know if this was your situation. But I remember growing okay. up in my you know evangelical church, there was a time when we did just the you know the piano and sort of the old fashioned hymns. Then we transitioned to the guitar and the drums. And this was a huge controversy. Like people had opinions and they were strongly yes. held and we weren't afraid to let loose our opinions. Was this your yes. experience, Mandy, where it's like church music, you're thinking, oh no, controversy. Oh, you ha- you <laughs> opened a big old can of worms just now. Because I went to a non-denominational evangelical church that merged with a Baptist traditional church and there was a kerfuffle 
Yes. <laughs> and we ended up, um, it actually ended up being very difficult because the music minister tried to merge them. But what did that mean? That meant he took the old hymns and like, jazzed them up and added drums and like <laughs> that no it did not work and so I that remember made I was, nobody happy it made absolutely nobody happy correct i remember i was a singer in the worship band and the first day that we did i think crown him with many crowns which he had syncopated mm. um yeah i was looking out and it was so sad because all of the little gray hairs which I'm one of those soon, but um, <laughs> all, they were trying to sing along and their fi- it was just so, it was, it's a tricky thing. So we actually ended up losing membership over it. Music is very personal to people, particularly when it's their mode of preparing their hearts to worship. And they really do feel like there's a right and a wrong yes. way. Yes. So, yeah, so Dell, in this difficult. in this fraud environment, you have been able to use music as a way to bring people from different backgrounds together. How has that happened in your case? Well, it, it's sort of simple. It's just we're not talking about music in worship. Yeah, we're yeah, not asking true. people to. You put a lot of pressure on music when you say it's supposed to make you feel God's presence. Woo, true. <laughs> right? And, and you know yeah. what I mean? And that's yes. a lot of pressure to put on the, the musicians, the, the composer, the listener, or the congregant, right? So mm-hmm. in DSX music events are about removing music from worship, removing it from its pressure to make worship happen in your heart or even corporately, and instead mm-hmm. saying, okay, now we're going to play music, and everybody gets to individually contemplate it, think about it, and then talk about it openly and honestly about how it makes you feel. So in that case, these events, we really like to call them musical Bible study because we, they're really about the Bible. And they're not, when you go to Bible study, I mean, yeah, you pray at the beginning and end, but no one, I don't think everybody thinks of Bible studies like where like, I feel the, the ecstasy of God's presence. I mean, <laughs> it depends how good your teaching pastor is, but you know, it's, it's, a, different, it's a, you know, it's a different, yeah, look at, listen to this Greek participle, hallelujah, you know, but it's like, you know, right. It's just, it's like a different thing. Like you go into a different expectations. So our right. events, whether they're online or live, you, you get together, you know, in a room with a stereo system or maybe a piano, and you're not expected to feel God's presence. You're, it's, you're more supposed to sort of study scripture and talk about faith, which is also means that these events can be run not by musicians, but by yeah. pastors, teaching pastors, lay leaders, because the music, while important, is a lens that allows mm-hmm. us to view scripture. And when you go by glasses, like what you care about is whether they can help you see like you don't spend a ton of time looking at the structure of the lens and the structure of the hinge. You know, they fit good, they look good, and then it's, do they work? And so the music right. is still functioning. And we're not really focusing on the lens. Now, we can dig into all these pieces to show how they work, but that's more of sort of musicological interest or theological interest, right? The Our events are about trying to get music to function effectively for lay people as a lens. Right. Does that sort of make sense? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So we are just about out of time, but I, I'd like to talk about how you view what your plans are for Deus Ex Musica going forward. Like now that, knock on wood, hopefully the COVID restrictions are going to be getting less and less restrictive. Do you have plans for further events? Do you have plans for putting further passages of scripture to, to music? What What are your plans going forward? Well, we have so many exciting plans happening right now. Right now, we're we're working on three things. First of all, we are continuing to use our new musical psalm settings as part of a discussion event, uh, live events in Toronto. And then also we're in conversation with doing something over down at Duke Divinity School and at mm-hmm. Baylor University, uh, live events, but also online, uh, offering to churches mm-hmm. and to seminaries opportunities to come together and listen and discuss. We're recording several uh, CDs of brand new sacred music, and these are all pieces for our current CD is for violin, and we're having 12 composers pick a psalm and respond to the psalm using just the violin, no words. Mm. So oh, it's wow. a really deep response, right? And um, yeah. we're actually repeating that project with viola, which is a slightly larger violin, mm-hmm. uh, and then also a cello. And the idea is that we're going to start to use these, both the recordings and the live events, as ways for people to even have a different kind of experience of Scripture, a more more abstract. And then finally, our, so our big project with several of your job is to basically try to create some kind of resource where essentially you can type in some scripture and immediately be taken to several different settings of it with commentary. Mm. 
so that if you're preparing a sermon or if you're reading it and you're reading, you know, who knows what, Psalm 148 or, you know, Jeremiah 26. I don't even know if there is a Jeremiah 26. But, you know, you can <laughs> yeah. find it, right? Basically, right. to allow people to find musical ways of exploring and engaging with Scripture. Mm. And we would love to have, like, a, the whole Bible indexed to mm. musical settings someday. So oh, wow. stay okay. tuned. That would be really, I think it would be really cool. Yeah. Um, that's, oh. that's sort of a long-term project. Oh, well, Stay tuned. I, I you did another to podcast. You, yeah, to, to you and to all the people working with you, please, please get this done as soon as possible. I, I will I mark know. it on my uh, internet homepage immediately. Yes. Um, so, yeah, we are running out of time now, uh, like I said. But, uh, Dell, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Really appreciated you. And uh, where can we find you right now? So, deusxmusica.com, D-U-S-E-X-musica.com is where you can find all about what we do, listen to the pieces of music. You can bring us to your church or your seminary to do these live or Zoom events. We do it all the time. If you want to listen to my own musical compositions inspired by the Bible and elements of the faith, you can find it at delvincase.com, D-E-L-V-Y-N, case. And yeah, I'm, uh, I just really happen to be here and have the chance to talk about these projects. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you again. And... Well, listeners, as you can tell, things are winding down at the Anselm Digital Pub. The fire is down to embers, the customers are trundling home, and you've polished off your final glass. Be sure to look out for wolves on your way back home. Once again, (laughs) Believe to See is a podcast of the Anselm Society. Thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you next time.